Hello friends, for today's video we're going to be looking at episodes 7 through 12 of Free Rin Beyond Journey's End. I really enjoyed episode 7 and then everything that plays off of the latter half of episode 7 and I don't really know if there's a formal name for this arc, but essentially Free Rin the Demon Slayer arc, I'll call it. We kick it off though with something much quieter and sweeter, which is where we see our characters traversing the countryside and the characters being Fern, Stark, and Free Rin. Now that Stark has officially joined our party, we are seeing a little bit more of the personalities playing off of each other. I'm gonna get way ahead of myself and say that Stark is proving to be my favorite character. I know that this is not relevant to the specifics of these episodes necessarily, but he's so sweet and so endearing. He's also a character type that could so easily be on the more boring side. I think something that Free Run is doing exceptionally is it's taking, as we see with its very setting and the fantasy races as a whole, something it's doing is it's playing off of what's very familiar to a lot of us who are fantasy fans. And then it's doing something that is very deep and quiet and oftentimes bittersweet with those types of stories. Specifically with Stark, he is a character that so often would become the less interesting or compelling character out of the party. But instead of that occurring, this time we see somebody who is absolutely darling. I really can't believe how much I'm already falling in love with him. There's just the fact that he is such a genuine person but while he does experience fear, and that's kind of a recurring joke for him, but also a recurring thing that is rooted, it seems, very much in what he went through with his home village, while that's a part of him, that's not all there is to him. He is somebody who, if he upsets somebody, he seems like he truly wants to make amends. It seems like he wants to live a wonderful life and then be able to go back to Aizen and tell him about it. He seeks his companionship, but he also is very sweet to just everybody he meets. And the reason that I let myself go on this little detour for a moment is because I feel this is very true just within the opening of episode seven. So there is a moment that could easily be overlooked, but you see that there's this traveler on a mountain pass and they can't get through because there was a landslide. And so Freerin and Fern and Stark are helping make sure that the path is cleared. And when the traveler is saying like, oh, thank you so much for doing this, there's a frame where Stark is looking back at the man and he looks so happy. He looks like he just absolutely loves to do good for other people. And obviously that's already something we've touched on with him at that particular area where the dragon was. He seems to really enjoy when people when he does nice things for people and when people are genuinely happy, he seems to really take a lot of joy from that. But the problem was it felt almost, I think for him in his mind, a little bit empty because he felt like it wasn't really earned and he hadn't really done anything to enrich people's lives. And here just this small act of helping clear the road seems to really have such an impact on him. He genuinely seems so filled with happiness. <laughs> but we also see that Fern is just quietly a, we need to get stuff done for the greater good because Stark asks, like, wouldn't it be easier to just move the wagon? And Free Run's like, well, yeah, but Fern says we have to fix this basically because it'll affect people that come through this area later. It's an interaction between Stark and Fern where she's like, Mr. Stark, can you please come here and assist me with this? And he's like, can you not call me that? And then immediately all decorum goes out the window and she's just like, hey, stop being lazy and like, come do this, please. I don't want to say she's cold, but she's maybe not filled with warmth in the same way that Stark is. She's maybe not as social and personable as, as he is, but she's a lot more introverted, I, I would say. And she can be a little bit more on the blunt side, but she is ultimately a very pure hearted person. Like she's always looking to do what is right. She's just a little quieter and, and to herself, which is why I'm enjoying the inclusion of Stark within their party so much beyond just the fact that I already love him as a character. Anyway, so they clear the mountain pass. That's <laughs> that's pretty much all that happens in that exact moment. And then there are additional statues and Freerun is remembering some of these uh, moments, of course, with her party. That's kind of a pattern that we see throughout the story. And there is, there's two quotes from Himmel specifically that I was like, oh man, what are you doing to me? So there's a part where she's Freerun 
is talking about like, what's the point of all of this? Why do the humans have to have their festivals and their statues? And you see in the past, he said the biggest reason as to why he wants these statues made. He says, I guess the biggest reason is so you won't be alone in the future. And I was like, oh, come on. We're not fairy tales. We really existed. And I'm like, oh no, come on. <laughs> Okay, so maybe more, maybe immortality would suck if everybody else didn't also get sick. Because there's a part of me, I'm sure many of us who read fantasy stories have asked ourselves before, like, would I want to live forever? And it depends on what time of the day you ask me. If I just woke up, I'm like, no, just end it. But then also other times when you have just, just life in general, I feel like a lot of us are like, it would be nice to not die. That's what this whole, I feel like so much of this story is. Sorry, this is getting very existential, but that's what this story does is it makes you ask these questions and think about these things. And I, I feel like a lot of us who are fantasy fans who read about certain races that do live for really long times, we're kind of like, what would that be like? When I think about it in that way, if everybody else around me is passing away to a point where I might even question if they existed because the rest of mankind is also going to forget them. So then it might become this distant thing that I don't even know if it was real or not. That sounds absolutely devastating. I, I'm like, I don't like this. <laughs> um, but it is very well done. Just to be clear, when I say I don't like this, I mean, it makes me sad. But it's, I think, good writing. But anyway, from that sad moment, then we segue into the beginning of a actually fuller arc, because thus far we've been getting not just episode length arcs, but almost half episode length. We start by the characters entering this bigger town, city. As they come through, immediately Freerin senses that there are demons around. And then I did really enjoy that when the demon, uh, Lord Lukner, when he is asking uh, I am watching the sub, and so I'm not sure how some of these are pronounced, but uh, Gr Granat, um, when he was like, oh, Granat, did you put this person up to this? And the, I wrote it down because it made me laugh, but Granat answers, while it's, while it's true, I want you dead. And I put, tell me how you really feel. I just like how upfront he is. I really like this character, even though he was only around for a little bit. I was like, can he join our party? I really like this guy. And it's sad that his son is dead. Anyway, so I really like that guy. They arrest Freerin though. And while she is imprisoned, Stark and Fern come to speak with her. And Stark is being the sweet person that he is, it's like, is there really no way that we can communicate with them and, and work something out? Because they can speak, so surely there must be a chance. And Freerin's like, trust me, there's no chance. And then you get this flashback of a time where Himmel was in a, a similar position, and he chose not to kill this small, what looked like child demon. I have a few thoughts and maybe predictions as to things that might occur later, and these can be totally wrong, but this is where I'm at thus far. So when when Freerin talks about elves and how they're pretty much dying out, how it's been a really long time since she's even seen another elf, they're very solitary, they don't necessarily have instincts that lead them to reproduce as frequently, hardly at all. As she's describing various things to do with elves and their culture, I'll say, a lot of it sounded really similar to how the demons and their culture is. So when you're getting this flashback, you have a moment where the the girl initially, she calls for her mom and that's what stops Himmel. And there's also this farmer who is like, you know, I could use help if you want to join. And it seems nice at first. She helps the farmer and the little girl is really cute with her and it seems like they're a family. And then you start to see later that the house is burned down. There are these huge slash marks on the village chief, I think was who the farmer was, but these huge slash marks on his back. And the woman whose daughter the demon had originally killed is saying, you know, like, I knew it, we should have killed you before. And Himmel asks, why did you kill the village chief? And she turns around, she doesn't really address what Himmel said. And she looks at the woman and she's carrying the, the child and she's like, oh, here, you're the one that hates me. So here I've made amends basically by handing her the little girl and free run eliminates the demon. There was a few things. One, she never really answered the question. Two, I'm like, did she kill a village chief? And then three, if they have no concept of family or an understanding, 
Like, where would the the notion to hand that little girl over to that woman come from? Like, why would she feel any need to try to, quote unquote, like, make amends for the fact that she did eliminate their daughter? Eliminate's the nice way to put it. Uh, I think she ate her or killed her at the very least. But it just kind of seems like there's something else there and that we didn't actually get the full story of that. Obviously, the demons in this city are not okay. (laughs) And they perpetuate the idea that they will utilize words like mother and father to manipulate humans. And the idea that they learn our language simply so that they can manipulate us. The people in present day that we're seeing, the demons we're seeing in present day, that is true for them. But I still am not convinced that it's true for all of them. And then second, I still feel like there's parallels with the elves. And I'm like, are they like two sides of the same coin? We know that when the when they die, the demons, that they sort of just like dissolve. But what happens when elves die? What happens with them? Because I haven't seen that happen yet. I mean, we've hardly seen elves. They're not really around. So yeah, I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know about this. I feel like maybe not all of them are bad. But maybe they are. Maybe I'm just uh, naive, like Stark. Who knows? <laughs> I also, I have one additional thing to add to this theory, which is that Yes, the demon says mom, and it's supposedly a manipulation tactic, but also Freerin says mother. And I think that this is, it's very possible it was just a joke because earlier in the first batch of episodes when they're cleaning up the beach, Fern (laughs) trying to actually get Freerin to wake up early, which happened, I will say, I forgot to mention this, it happened at the beginning of episode seven, she woke up early and they're like, we have to praise her. (laughs) And that was cute. But anyway, so Fern is telling her like, oh, I'm practically your mother. I have to like help you get dressed and help feed you and all these things. And there's one morning where Free Run is waking up and she says, mother. And at first I thought it was just funny, like she's calling Fern that because of the whole conversation they they had about it. But then I'm like, I don't know. I kind of wonder if there's like this instinct maybe between what happened with Freerun in that moment and then also this particular demon you see in the past. Otherwise then the demons are just bad and they're less interesting when they're just bad. I feel like there's got to be more going on there but maybe there's not and that's okay. So I wrote, oh dang, that was violent at the end of uh, episode seven because you see the guard is killed and then Freerun is strung up. We do then go to episode eight. You see Freerun defeats this particular demon and the other demons almost seem like they can sense it and they don't seem that choked up about it. They're like, ha, oh, geez, okay, well, he was irrational. The other character, Granat, can tell like something's amiss because the mage escaped and the guard is dead, but also your guy is missing what's going on. And during this confrontation, this is where we see this particular demon's magic, which is really cool. It's animated really cool. The idea of it's really cool. When was, uh, there was a moment during it, and I won't pinpoint the exact moment because I don't want to spoil things for people, but there was a moment where I was like, oh my gosh, is he about to turn to a titan? <laughs> I was very nervous when Granat got hurt. I was like, no, I like this guy. Don't kill him. And he was all right, which was good. But when Stark comes and he says, I thought that my son had come for me, I was like, oh man, this guy and his son, this is sad. Anyway, Stark tries to rescue him. Fern tries to rescue them both. And Freerun's like, I gotta go deal with the demon who's outside the city. She leaves. And the scene where there's sort of this standoff between the two demons and then Fern and Stark, there's a frame where the demon right before Fern attacks when she says like, I'm sensing something and she senses it way too late. And when he looks up and within the frame, the glass has already started to come at his face before you really are aware of the attack as it's happening. I really enjoyed that. I thought that was really cool. And you do see Aura the guillotine as an enemy and you see this standoff between Freerun and her. I really liked the detail as Freerun is trying to outwit Aura that she recognizes the pendants on the suits of armor and then you as a viewer recognize that one of them is likely Granat's son which proves true at the conclusion of this arc and that was really sad but also at least there's like some sense of closure with all of that and then also there is sort of bringing back the fact that Himmel would say you need to be more cautious. Your your spells can actually do a lot of harm. And so she really does rely on outsmarting Aura rather than just going through and being a powerhouse. You do also discover though within this 
that she uses a tactic that her mentor taught her, which is that she suppresses her mana. I did think it was interesting because they talk about this being like a mockery of magic, and I'm kind of like, I mean, you guys are slaughtering a lot of people. <laughs> you don't really have room to judge principles here, but I'm like, whatever it takes. And I, I mean, I understand that there is this concept of it is representing their status. It's very much a part of their culture, so much so that they would never even think to do it. So I understand there's a reason for it, but just as somebody, uh, an objective third party looking at the situation, I'm like, it just kind of feels like something clever to do. And the whole fight was great. The, the fight, as we have these three different groups having these standoffs, so you have Lugner and Fern, and then you have Stark and I don't remember her name, Lenny, I think was her name. You have them, yeah, or I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but it's it's spelled somewhat like that, Linny. Um, so you have their standoff, she's mimicking Aizen's moves, and he realizes just because you're mimicking his moves doesn't mean that you've got all of the strength behind them, so he allows himself to get injured. But just the way that they're happening simultaneously there, the frames and everything, I thought those were so cool, and I'm looking forward to seeing additional uses of magic and magic fights. Part of me is like, I need to see. I know we kind of see it with the demon versus Fern, but I'm like, I want to truly see a mage versus mage fight. Because even Aura and Freerun, it was not quite that. It was that spell with the scales. That didn't really count. I want to see, like, magic go all out. Or just in general, where you don't have each party member having their own individual fight, but there's a big fight and they all play a role in that. I'm like, I'm assuming that's coming. And I look forward to it because the animation for this is great. I did really like before the fight even happened, though. And I don't want to forget to mention this because the humor in this is very silly. But when they're getting ready and prepping and they're they're making sure that Granat is kept safe and that he is has some people to care for him, that Stark is like, I'm gonna go. And Fern's like, oh, and she seems so taken aback by this act of bravery. She's like, what are you gonna do? And he's like, I'm gonna go beg Freerun to come back. Not funny though, within the next episode, you're sort of getting flashbacks with Freerun and her mentor. I also really like the detail. I don't think they ever acknowledge it, at least not at this point, but Freerun wearing her master's earrings. I really like that little detail and the way that she sort of remembers her through that. And just the repetition of Freerun having to watch people around her age and die is very sad. Within the flashback, you hear that the Demon King wanted all of the elves dead. Once again, I'm just sort of storing this away for why would he want all of the elves dead, especially because mages can be humans, and then there's also the priests that have their own kind of magic, and they seem to pose a threat also to demons. So why specifically are elves? Because even the demon, the three demons that come for them, they say, you know, yeah, you can leave as long as you leave the mage behind. We don't really care, or excuse me, I'm so sorry. As long as you leave the elf behind, we don't really care what you do. I don't really understand or know just yet why they would be so occupied in their minds with eliminating the elves and not care about mages who seem like a threat. And once again, I'm kind of like, is it because there's some war that occurred with them before even Freerun's time? I really hope to find that out eventually within this, if not this season, then at least at some point within this story. Also not cute, uh, how Freerun defeats Aura. So not only does she end up overpowering her, which then gives her power over Aura, but then when she tells her to just eliminate herself, I was like, okay, that's kind of dark. Whatever you got to do though, free run. Within the next episode, we do have some levity and some sweetness. You see that Granat gets his son's armor back. Then there is the whole joke about the fact that they're going to have Stark punished for how he spoke to him. And then every time Stark sees the guard, he instantly gets scared. But fortunately for Stark, they don't stay there for too long and they do move along as they head out to the mountains. And this is where they find another elf for once. And it's interesting because Fern opens the door and she sees this elf just working out. And then it just is there for a moment and then she closes it and she's like, we have to leave, there's a pervert here. I don't know why she thinks that working out makes you a pervert, I don't really know, but she seems convinced and then it turns out he's actually very nice and, and very sweet and Stark had become very cold when they were on their travels and so Stark gets to wake up and have his introduction to the elf just be the elf warming him up and he's like, ha! Ah. The elf's name is Craft. I really, really thought it was so sweet when he makes 
that pendant and he talks about Fern and then he also has this really sweet conversation with Freerin. I want him to join our party. We, <laughs> he's really cool and he seems really nice and we could use somebody with, you know, his abilities. We don't have this member of the party just yet. So can he join? I would like it if he joined. Maybe later. I like this character, though, and I want him to come back. During this exchange between the two of them, though, you do see some additional thoughts about Heiter, and you do see that Freerin says that Heiter is in heaven now, which was very sweet, and that Heiter, you discover, was an orphan, and he himself founded an orphanage. And then we get to episode 12, the last one for today. This episode, I really, really enjoyed. You get additional cute interactions between the characters as well as developing them individually a little bit more. For some reason, Fern once again uses the word pervert to describe because she, this time, instead of saying this towards Kraft, she says it toward Stark for him just being nice and trying to help out. <laughs> I don't know why that is her go-to, but she's convinced and she's uh, she's like, no, no, I'll just do everything myself and I'll help free run myself. And he's like, I don't understand what I did. You do get this story that once again, we're kind of playing on some fantasy tropes and this sword in the stone. It turns out the Himmel never actually pulled the sword from the stone, despite all of the stories saying that he had, which this does throw Stark for a loop a little bit, and then it leads him to think about who he imagines as a hero, and you discover that the person he imagined was his brother, and you get a little more context to what happened when he ran. This was really sad. It was already sad in concept, even without the additional details, when Aizen talked about how he will make a great warrior because of the fact that he ran the past so he now can live to protect others, and how you imagine that there's something in Aizen's past that was similar, but then when you see those additional details, you're like, you were just a little boy, and your family... They did what they could, but also you're not a coward. Just because you get scared doesn't make you a coward. You were small just because you ran in that moment. It doesn't mean, it doesn't really mean anything bad. You were so young, you couldn't have done anything. You wouldn't have been able to change anything. There's also a quote where you see specifically about how Himmel didn't pull the sword from the stone. That says, future generations always romanticize heroes to the point that their original nature eventually disappears. And I think that the idea of legacy and what is left behind, that this is another additional factor within that theme throughout this story. But we do have some moments that are not just sad and bittersweet, but we also have some very silly moments, one of which would be Stark looking at the clouds. <laughs> and I wrote my notes, oh, Stark is sweet and dumb. That part was so silly. I really am enjoying the fact that we have a mix of these very heartwarming moments, these very poignant moments, these bittersweet moments, and then on top of that, we have these very, very silly moments, usually centered around Stark. Probably why I'm loving him so much. I also see Freerin and her weird obsession with clothes and spells that have to do with clothes and substances that have to do with removing clothes. So it's like, Freerin, you need to think about this a little bit, okay? You need to analyze why people are telling you it's odd. And it's funny because Fern calls everybody else a perv, but it's kind of like, Freerin, don't make her say that to you. There's one last quote that I noted from this batch of episodes, and that is, the warrior Stark I've known hasn't run, which I thought was a, another lovely exchange between our characters. I'm continuing to really enjoy this story. I think this group of episodes so far has been maybe, I think, better than the first chunk. Not that the first ones are bad, and maybe saying better isn't the right way to put it. I think it is just allowing for a lot of what has been set up for us to dig a little bit deeper and what we've been set up with. It's like, okay, it's not just gonna remain here. We're going to expand on this. And we've done this with the action. We've done this with the characters. We've done this with the way that I described in the first batch is we're sort of superimposing memories into the present and learning from those things. So I am really enjoying it. I really enjoyed this batch of episodes and I can't wait to see what happens next. But that is it for a chat through, a discussion for episodes 7 through 12 of Freer and Beyond Journey's End. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.